Hi, my name is James Stannard. I'm a senior graphics engineer at Microsoft and the main contributor to MiniEngine. I will be talking about the new features and everything that has changed since our first presentation last year. Before I discuss the new features, I should recap what MiniEngine actually is. MiniEngine is a DX12 sample engine. It's not intended in any way to compete with commercial game engines, but it is in fact more of a learning tool. We built a foundation of helpful classes on top of DirectX 12 to get you up and running more quickly as you transition from 11 to 12. It's as much a learning tool as an engine of experimentation. I encourage you to watch our first presentation here on YouTube if you are new to MiniEngine. MiniEngine can be found on GitHub at the supplied URL, which is adjacent to many other DX12 samples. We've been pushing new features and bug fixes since we started, and if you submitted a pull request, We'll be happy to take a look and decide if we can incorporate your changes directly into our master branch. In our first presentation, we mentioned some topics we were investigating and planned to develop in the future. For our compute-based particle renderer, that time has come. This is one of the most substantial new features, and I'll go into more detail in a second. But we also have some improvements to our utility classes, and the GPU timing system got overhauled a bit to be more robust. It's a common question, what happened to generate mitmaps in reference to DX12 uh, relative to DX11? Do I have to write my own? And the answer is yes, but we've taken the time to write one for you using compute shaders. We also got questions about how to load other model formats, or at least to convert to other formats supported by our model viewer. We recently added the projects and sample code that we use to convert the Sponza scene. I've listed a few other changes here, and I'll be going over everything in more depth shortly. With our new particle renderer, we took AMD's ideas for using a tiled renderer to more efficiently rasterize particle effects. This is all implemented with compute shaders, which is kind of a theme in MiniEngine, so it's possible to simulate and render particle effects completely on the compute queue. The idea is very similar to tiled deferred shading, and the main advantage is that you only have to alpha blend each pixel once. It avoids the overdraw bottleneck and can make your worst case particle effects that much more manageable. The GPU buffer class used to have a creation parameter, which indicates how the buffer was to be used. I thought it would be better to use explicit types derived from GPU buffer instead so that the code was more readable. You can now use IntelliSense to determine what type of a buffer you, your variable points to. The downside is that you can never change the type later, but that was not something we ever wanted to do. Our profiling system depends on a robust GPU timestamp system. We cleaned up that system so that it's simpler and more straightforward it also happens to be more efficient and more reliable. As I was saying earlier, one of the features of DX11 that ended up missing in DX12 is generate MIPS. This is most often used with dynamic textures so that they can be sampled more efficiently. By the way, this feature was not accidentally left out of 12. It adds complexity and more test cases for the driver, which is against the philosophy of 12. We took the liberty of writing a replacement routine, so if you want to, you can modify it for your purposes or use it as is. It's implemented using compute shader dispatches so that multiple MIPS can be written in one pass without as many trips to memory. This might not actually be faster than using pixel shaders and render targets due to the difference in write speeds of various hardware. So your mileage may vary and you might still want to roll your own, but at least you have a result you can test against to see if your implementation handles all the edge cases. By popular demand, we provided the code that we used to convert the Sponza scene from .obj to .h3d. OBJ is not a good real-time format, so we process and optimize it for H3D. We didn't initially release this code because it depends on a third-party library called ASIMP, which is the Open Asset Import Library. It uses a different open source license, so instead we provide instructions about where to find it and how to include it in your build. We also spruced up our final display path. This engine was originally written for Xbox, where the largest display we expected to see was 1080p. We've made PC displays more of a first-class citizen now. You can resize the window and actually get more pixels. We also decoupled the native resolution from the display resolution and provided a variety of upsampling or downsampling filters. And we made sure to maintain the popular pixel doubling and quadrupling options, which avoids filtering, so that you can scrutinize your pixels more closely without pulling out a magnifying glass. High dynamic range rendering is a critical feature of many modern games, and we've continued to explore related algorithms and optimizations. You will find most of our learnings buried in our post-effects pipeline. We're also planning for the future displays that will support much higher brightness, contrast, and color gamut. With Windows 10, we also saw the release of DirectX 12 in Visual Studio 2015. Because we give all of these away and because they were worked together so well, we are abandoning older versions of Visual Studio. 
VS 2015 gives you better graphics profiling and debugging capabilities with VSGD, and we also like the more modern compiler with much better support for C++11 and C++14. I would have liked to list all of the bugs we fixed, but we don't have anything like a complete list. Most bugs just get fixed as needed with a, without a formal process. Suffice it to say that we are trying to keep up with bugs, so as time goes on, hopefully we introduce fewer bugs than we fix. Because we have our own Git repository that we work out of, we'll sit on many bug fixes for a while before they get pushed out to our GitHub repo. Moving on, I'd like to talk a bit about some of our other new features that aren't quite fully baked. We've been working on them, and they are interesting and useful, but they're not quite ready for prime time. With our new particle renderer, we had to have a particle simulator to feed it things to draw. This is still a prototype, but it was good enough for us to test our renderer. We demonstrate how to maintain a dynamic particle pool that can grow and shrink. All of the work is handled by the GPU, including spawning new particles and updating their state. And let me restate that because the entire particle system is implemented as compute shader dispatches, you can do the whole thing asynchronously from start to finish on the compute queue. We've had temporal anti-aliasing for a while, but it used to be tightly coupled with motion blur. The premise was that both required the velocity buffer, and you got the most accurate reprojections when nothing moved. When things do move quickly, you worry less about aliasing because you are already blurring it a lot. But it turns out that all anti-aliasing is a lot less effective in HDR space where we do the motion blur. Really bright pixels next to much dimmer pixels will continue to alias a lot. You need to anti-alias in a more perceptual space. So we fixed that, but it's somewhat slower now. That's why this is still a work in progress. Asynchronous compute is something we're pretty excited about. It's one of the really nice new features that DirectX 12 brings to the table. In a nutshell, when you have one command queue, the GPU serializes all work. Sure, draws can overlap and even dispatches can too, but if there are any pipeline stalls, all that work gets backed up. If you have independent work to be done, such as physics calculations for the next frame, it can now keep running in the background while the graphics pipeline is stalled. Also, if they are using different parts of the GPU like graphics that is bandwidth heavy and compute that is ALU heavy, they can much better utilize the whole GPU. All of this is especially useful to us because MiniEngine implements practically the entire PostFX pipeline with compute shaders. So in the future, we hope to be post-processing one frame while we start rendering the next frame. We have even more things that we've been working on or want to work on soon. We aren't ready to commit to any dates, but I expect that next time I present what's new in MiniEngine, that some of these will be in the what's new and others will be in the works in progress category. These are all important effects and features, and I just wanted to give you something like a roadmap with where Mini Engine is going next. Rendering a graph isn't that hard, but we're trying to find the right way to interact with the plots. We think it will be valuable to have a, a visible history of stats in our profiling system so that you can notice anomalies and see how some stats might be correlated. The code is actually in there already, but it's not ready to be turned on. We're in the process of refactoring it. Bokeh depth of field is a hot buzzword in current Jan AAA games. It adds to realism by better simulating camera focus, but it's not a cheap effect. Different implementations have popped up to make it more affordable, and we're also trying to make it as affordable as, say, our SSAO effect. It's a hard problem, but we're working on it right now. Another reason why DirectX 12 is awesome is that you can use all available GPUs in your system. Unlike traditional SLI, where you had to have matching GPUs, and the driver would sometimes be able to split work across them. With DX12, you can mix and match different classes of devices and even from different vendors. One reason you might want to do this is that a lot of people out there have an integrated GPU along with their discrete part. If you detect extra GPUs, you can put them to work and not let them sit idle. And yet another reason, probably the biggest reason, why we like DirectX 12 is that it's much more CPU friendly, especially when it comes to multi-core CPUs. There's no reason not to parallelize your rendering code as much as it makes sense now. Each CPU core can be building up a command list for execution, and then the main thread can execute them all at once. This is nearly a linear speedup. In other words, if you have four cores, your render thread will be done in a fourth of the time. Texture streaming has been a challenge on PC. Even on consoles, it wasn't the most efficient until developers got access to virtual memory. Well, DX12 exposes virtual memory now too. We have a plan for how this will work, but the core strategy is that you should not have to defragment memory when textures stream out. Instead, you can just decommit a physical page and reuse it with a new texture that you were streaming in. You can have a very large address range 
and each texture will be allocated its own space in the range. When the texture is paged out, it just means that you aren't dedicating any physical memory to it. We hope that our implementation will serve as a guide for console games that want to transition to the PC. In conclusion, we've added lots of new features, and we have many more coming soon. We welcome the developer community's feedback, and we hope that you find MiniEngine useful. We want to continue to be useful and relevant as people get on the DX12 bandwagon. So let us know what you'd like to see by connecting with us on GitHub. Finally, I'd like to thank all of the people who help provide knowledge, guidance, and code to our effort. There are a lot of people behind the scenes, and it really is a team effort. Everybody I've listed here wants to help the game developers make better games by sharing knowledge and collaborating. And all of us want to push the envelope. Thanks for listening.